Hello and welcome to today's seminar, which is going to be about uh, parallel programming with MPI and uh, Python. So what is parallel computing? Uh, parallel computing is uh, necessary if you have a problem which is so large that it will not link, uh, it will not uh, work uh, on a single computer. You will not be able to compute it on a single computer. This is especially important because uh, single computers have stagnated in performance. They haven't really, a, a single core of a serial computer hasn't really improved that much in performance. So uh, parallelism is more and more necessary. And unfortunately, parallelization cannot just be handled for you by the compiler. You have to write your own parallel code. Compilers are not smart enough to write parallel code. And various approaches to parallelization have been uh, tried since the 1990s. The most popular method is message passing, and this is what we are going to be talking about today. So in this method, you have uh, a parallel computer consisting of multiple serial computers. These computers do not share memory. They have distinct memory spaces. And so they have to communicate via a network. And every time data has to be exchanged between com these computers, you pass a message. This is in contrast to shared memory, shared memory processors, where you have multiple cores and uh, threads running on these cores can just access uh, the same region of memory, so you don't have to explicitly move data. But message passing can still be used on a shared memory computer. So what is MPI? MPI stands for Message Passing Interface. It is a language independent communications protocol, so it's not tied to a particular programming language. It is portable, platform independent, and it is today the de facto standard for parallel computing on distributed memory systems. Uh, it's a standard, so various implementations exist. The most popular is OpenMPI. You also have vendor versions. So if you buy your computer and it has Intel chips, you can buy the Intel version of MPI. MPI is extremely popular, and uh, many packages and software libraries have uh, parallel MPI versions. But the principal drawback is it is quite hard to program in MPI, it is generally hard to, to program in parallel for parallel computers because you have imagined you have all the difficulty of writing for a single a program for a single computer, which is already hard enough. And then on top of it, you are adding the additional complication that now you have multiple computers forming a parallel computer. So as I said, MPI is not a new programming language. It, instead, it's a collection of functions and macros in a library that can be used in programs written in C, C++, Fortran, and Python, as we will see. And in Python, uh, MPI is made available via a module called MPY for PY. Now, most MPI programs, well, practically all of them, are based on a single program multiple data model. What this means is that you write a single program, but when you start it, you don't just run one copy of the program, you run multiple copies. So you run multiple clones of the program on different uh, processors in your parallel computer, but each clone can use the input data to decide what to do. So each clone will get slightly different input data, and on this basis, it can do slightly different things. And then as your program is running, these clones, these instances can communicate with each other. So MPI in Python, it's made, made available via a very nice wrapper called MPI, MPI for PY. It's an object-oriented approach, as uh, all Python is. It is, I would say, very user-friendly and much simpler than using Python in a language like C or C++ or Fortran, mainly because uh, calling an MPI function in C requires that you give a set number of arguments. There, there's many arguments, even if you're not using them, you have to provide them and you have to understand what they mean. Whereas uh, in Python, the MPI wrapper will guess some of the argument values. So if you don't provide the value, it will make a reasonable guess, which actually makes it much simpler, much simpler to use for beginners. So here are the links where you can uh, find MPI for PY and find the docs. For best results, try to use the latest version. For example, if you are installing MPI, MPI for PY on your Ubuntu box, it might actually install an older version, which is buggy and poorly documented. So really try to get the latest version. And then when you have everything installed, the way you run your uh, 
Python MPI program is like this. So the first command is MPI run, and then the number of process, processors, processes you want. So MPI run, basically, this is the mechanism which cre creates the clones of your program, and the dash NP flag indicates how many clones you want. And then you have Python command and your Python program. So a few preliminaries. So uh, here's some vocabulary I will be using uh, during the rest of this talk. So a process is an instance of a program. It can be created or destroyed. MPI uses a group of statically allocated processes. So when you launch an MPI program with MPI run, you specify how many processes you want, and this, this, the number of processes is static, static during the execution of the program. This is unlike threads. In the, in the thread model, you can create and destroy threads as your program is proceeding. In MPI, the number of processes is fixed. Now, in the, while the MPI program is running, each process, or clone, as I said before, is assigned a unique number, or rank. So if you have P processes, then the ranks are zero, up to P minus one. Now, when you're running your program, the number of processes you create is not necessarily the number of processors on your computer. So you can have a single core available on your computer and run more than one process. But generally, to achieve parallel speed up, you must have one process per core. So it's OK you know, if you have only four cores on your computer. You could launch an MPI process with 32 MPI program with 32 processes just for debugging, but it would not actually give you parallel speed up. So these processes, which MPI creates, they, they each have distinct memory spaces, so they cannot directly access each other's data. So if you need to send the data between one process and another, and almost always you have to, because you know if you are writing a parallel program, your processes have to coordinate with each other somehow and exchange data. So to communicate data, you have to have explicit function calls, both on the process which is sending the data, which uses some kind of a send function, and the process which receives the data, which has to use some kind of a receive function. And for this communication to successfully complete, both a send and a receive must be executed on the sending process and the receiving process respect, respectively for the communication to be successful. So what does an MPI program in Python look like? Well, let me just give you the general skeleton. So first you import the MPI for PY module or you import from that module. Then you initialize MPI and then you do your computations where as you do your computations, you are using MP MPI communications to exchange data as needed. Now, once you are done, you shut down MPI. So let me talk about some of the tools that we are going to be using before I show you the first sample program. So first, I have to create my MPI communicator object, which I will, be, and then I will be using the methods of this object for actual communications. So I import the MPI for PY module, or in this case, I import from the module the MPI. And uh, I create my communicator in the second line. So this communicator has various methods. Uh, so the send method is shown here. So if I want to send something, I call com.send. And this has three arguments. So the first is, uh, aside from self, the, the first argument is the actual object you're sending. So you provide your integer your, or your float or your array, whatever you want to send. The second argument is the destination argument. So here you specify the number of the process where you want this information to go. And the final argument, an optional argument, is the tag argument. So you can tag your message, which allows you to distinguish between them. We will not be using this argument uh, in, in our examples, but sometimes it's important. Uh, this is to make sure that the right messages get to the right destinations. So the way the send method works is that if the object you are sending is small enough, your program might actually continue past the send call, even though your message hasn't actually arrived at the destination, which is actually good because that means your program doesn't always stop at that point until the and until the message actually reaches the destination, but can continue. But that's only if the buffer sp space is big enough. So if the object you're sending is too large, the buffer space will not be sufficient, and then your program will stop at the send line until another process does a receive and 
transfers the information. So, and here we have the, the second uh, related process. This is the receive process. So, uh, the, the receive method rather. So, uh, you call this on the process which is to receive the data. So, the arguments are, uh, well, you have the buffer argument, and this, this will have the object which will store the data to be received. Then the source argument, this indicates the uh, wh which process are you receiving this data from. So if you don't provide this, it will actually use an any, any source wildcard. So it will just accept a message no matter where it's, which other process it's coming from. But that, that is generally unsafe, I would say. So it's, it's important to specify specifically which process you want to receive the message from. The tag is optional again. And in the receive call, you have one additional argument called status, which allows you to query some data about the message. But the default value is none, and we will not be using this value. So uh, in this method, uh, the program always stops if you invoke the receive call, your program will stop there until the message is actually received. So, so this is fully blocking. The message has to arrive before your program keeps going. Which means, for example, if you have a receive call which doesn't match some sent call on some other process, your program will deadlock because it will just wait forever for the message to arrive. So in general, it's important when you write your program to make sure that for each send you have a matching receive. They always must be in pairs. So these ranks, what are they? Uh, well, to, to, so to send a message, I need to know what is my own rank and how many processes there are in total. So there's a get rank method. So if you call this on any particular process, it returns the, the number of, of this process. And the, the get size method, returns how many processes there are in our communicator. So this number ha comes from NPI run. You remember we, when we started the program, we did NPI run dash NP and then four or something. If we have four, then get size will return four. Okay, so uh, with these preliminaries out of the way, let's actually look at uh, our first uh, basic NPI program. And all this NPI program will do is it will have each parallel process, which is not, which doesn't have rank zero, send a message to process which has rank zero. And then the process which has rank zero will print that message out. So let's uh, walk through this. So first we import from NPI for PY module. We start our communicator. So you have to keep in mind that this program, multiple copies of this program are running on different processes. So you have to imagine that this program, there's many clones of it running at the same time. But when we get to this line, each of these clones calls get rank. And then my rank will store the ID number, the, the rank of each process. And this will be different on each process. So there will be a process where rank is zero, there will be a process where rank is one, and so on up to P minus one, where P is the total number of processes you started. And indeed we can obtain that value here. So uh, calling get size, we find out what P is, and P is the total number of processes. So he here, we're, here is where divergence is occurring. So different ranks will do different things. So I want to, wh what I want to happen here is all the ranks which don't have rank zero, so rank one, rank two, they will create a message, and they will send this message to process zero. So the message is a string containing the, the rank, and then com.send sends this message to process zero, destination zero. And then the else here, the else is, uh, that's the code which runs when rank is zero. So on process zero, there's a loop because process zero wants to receive this message from every other process. So there's a loop uh, for proc ID in range one to P minus one, and uh, we call com.receive, so this receives the message, and we specify the source, and the source is the uh, loop uh, variable. So the source will be one and two and three and so on. And we print out the, the message which we get. So the output looks like this. So I do npa run dash np4, meaning I invoked MPI, I create four processes, I run the program, and I receive a message. So, so here process zero is printing. 
and process 0 receives a message from process 1, process 2, process 3, and it prints it out. So here's our basic MPI program, which uh, shows us uh, what MPI does. But uh, that program is uh, not very interesting, so let's actually try to compute something, because this is what uh, we will uh, generally use MPI uh, parallel programming for. So let's compute an integral. and. Uh, there's many situations where an integral has to, compute it, has to be computed numerically. Quite often, you don't have a, you know, a closed form answer, answer for the integral. So uh, the, most stand, the most basic way to compute an integral is of the blue curve here is to construct a red curve made out of straight line segments. And you can see that uh, the area under the blue curve is approximately equal to the area under the red curve. And you can see that the segments uh, under the red curve are trapezoids. So this is called the trapezoid method. And if we increase the number of, of points and we make our trapezoids smaller and smaller, generally the area under the red curve is going to appro approximate the area under, under the blue, blue curve. And of course, what's nice about the area under the red curve is that that area has a very nice uh, uh, closed form expression. It's just a bunch of areas of trapezoids. So uh, here, this is written out. We have our integral of some function from A to B can be approximated by this formula, which is just the, the area of the trapezoids, as I have drawn them. So the way we can uh, compute this in parallel is we can take our segment from A to B, and we can divide it into smaller segments. Let's say, so then process 0 will compute the integral from a to a plus n over ph. Process 1 will do the next segment. So that each segment is uh, working on a smaller area with a smaller number of segments. So each process then does a part of the integral, and then we want to collect the results and add them up, and that will give us uh, uh, the full value of the integral. OK, so let's pick a simple function to integrate. Uh, we could have chosen anything, I take x squared, because the nice thing about it is I know the, the actual analytic answer for it, so it will be easy to compare our numerical result to the full result. So uh, then I write a function to do a serial computation of the, uh, uh, using the trapezoid method. So if I was using a, a single computer and I was, um, computing the integral from A to B using n trapezoids and the length of each trapezoid would be h, I would be using this formula. So this is just the implementation of uh, the su summation expression, which I have shown you before. And then here is the, the actual uh, parallel program. So here I want to compute the integral from A to B of a function of f of x. So I'm going to divide my segment from A to B into the number of pieces equal to the number of processes I have, and then each process will do a part of the int integral. So uh, I have uh, various uh, variables, A, B, A is the beginning of the integration, here I take it to be 0, B is the end, I take it to, take it to be 1. I have 1,024 points. Here, for simpl simplicity, I'm assuming that the number of points, the number of trapezoids is exactly divisible by the number of processes. It just simplifies the code. So uh, so here's what my program looks like. I do the preliminary, so I import uh, MPI uh, from MPI for PY. I initialize my communicator, and I find out the, the rank and the size for each process. And here I am, in this code, I'm just going to hardwire the, the values. So I'll set A, B, and N to whatever uh, I want uh, them to be. And uh, I set destination to be zero because, so destination is the variable where we, this is the process which will, will, will be receiving the data at the end to add it up, and this will be process zero. And finally, I define total, which for now I make it minus one. And we will, th this is where we will be accumula accumulating the answer. So now in this part of the code, I have each process compute its own portion of the integral the partial integral. So here, each process has to figure out its local integration limit. So local A and local B, this is, this is the integration range that each process has to do. And uh, each process uses my rank to determine which part of the integral is responsible. 
4. So for example, if i plus is 0, then this will be 0. So that means that my integration limit on the left is a, and my integration limit on the right is whatever it was the left limit plus local n times h. So local n is the total number of points in the integration divided by p, where p is the number of processors. And then h is the total range of the integral divided by n, which is the number of points. And here I call the trapezoid method. So this computes the partial answer. So the integral here is the partial integral. So this is the part of the answer which each process has at this point. So next, I have to do the communication. And I have to, each process has to send the partial answer to process 0. And process 0 is going to collect these answers and add them up and then print the result. So what happens here? Well, if my rank is 0, so if I am process 0, I will first take the total value and initialize it with the partial integral that process 0 has already computed. And then process 0 will do a loop where it receives from every other process the partial integral value computed by that process. So I call it receive. The source is the source value from my uh, loop. And uh, then I receive uh, the integral value and I store it, store it in the integral. Here I do a little print statement just to integrate, just to show what's going on. And then I increment the total, which is the total value of integral with the number I received. And I continue this loop to receive the data from every other process in my parallel computation and to add its contribution to the total integral. So this is what happens on process zero. So on the other, the other processes, well, they have to send the data. So the other processes do a little print statement to indicate what's going on. And then they do a send. So they send their integral value to process zero. So notice uh, we always have the pairs, right? So each process, which is not zero, does a send. And then process zero does a receive for each process through this loop. So there's a match. Every send is matched with receive. And uh, finally, uh, process zero, at the end of this, process zero has a value stored in the total variable, which is the, the final answer. So finally, we have process zero print out uh, the total value. And then we call MPI finalize, which shuts down MPI nicely. And uh, in general, it's good to call MPI finalize to shut down MPI correctly. So this is the output of this program. This is what it looks like. So um, here I am uh, calling MPI run with uh, dash and p. Here I have four processes. And then Python invoke the in interpreter and the uh, Python function. And here you can see that uh, process three has computed a part uh, of the integral. Process two has computed a part of the integral. Process one has computed a part of the integral. And each one of these processes is sending this information to process zero. And then process zero is in turn receiving this information. And uh, it's accumulating the integral. So, uh, so, so we can see that th there's a match, right? So process one is send sending this value to process zero, and then process zero is receiving this value from process one. Process two is sending this value to process zero, and process zero is receiving this value, and then process three is sending this value, and pr process zero is receiving this value. So finally, we print out our answer, and here it is, and the actual analytic answer is one third. So, you know, we are pretty close. And if we increase the, the number of trapezoids, we would, uh, our answer would be closer and closer to the, to the actual value. So the summary at this point is here are all the MPI calls I have used to write my parallel program. So I had to import my MPI module. I had to initialize my communicator, initialize MPI. And then I had to use the following methods of the communicator object, get rank, get size, send and receive. And finally, I had finalized, just call, I called this once at the end to shut down MPI. So 
with just these few MPI methods, you can write a, a viable, simple MPI parallel program. This is, in a sense, all you need. Because send and receive are very general methods. You can send anything. You can receive anything. So that's fundamentally what you need. However, th this is just the beginning of MPI. There's many, many, many other methods to MPI. Uh, so the methods which MPI provides are there to make your code more efficient and more convenient to write. And uh, in this short seminar, I can only give you a taste of what these additional methods are. But the one I want to talk about is probably the most useful, and uh, th these are collective communications. So collective communications involve all the processes in a communicator. So let's look at broadcast and reduce. So a broadcast is something that you very frequently need in your, uh, in your parallel program. You have one process which has a value, which has some value, and you want this value to be propagated to all the other processes. So you could accomplish this with just the calls I have already shown you before, with MPI send and MPI receive. You could have each uh, MPI process. Uh, you could have process which has the data, have a loop, and the process which has the data could have a loop where it does an MPI send to every other process, and then every other process has a receive statement and it receives this data. And this could definitely be done. But a broadcast method is much simpler because you call bcast, you specify what the data is that you want to have broadcasted, and you specify which is the root process, so which process has the data. So you call this one line, and at the end of this, Every single process which calls bcast will have this data in the object variable. So your code is much simpler because you are, accomplish, you are accomplishing in just one line what would have required an if statement and a loop to accomplish if you, just, if you were doing just MPI send and MPI receive. So already you have a significant gain in that your code becomes simpler. You can accomplish in one line what re required many lines previously. But this is not just about making your code look uh, simpler. You also want better performance. So if you, let's think about how broadcast works. If I, route my, if I write my own broadcast routine where I have a loop, so let's say I have a process zero and this process has to send information to all the other processes. If I do this through a loop, so Let's say I do MPI send first to process one from process zero, then MPI send to process two, MPI send to process three, MPI send to process four, and so on. If I do it like this, then the data will be exchanged, but the amount of time it takes to propagate the data scales with the number of processors. So the more processors processes I have, the longer it takes because I have to send data one after the other to each one. But what if I implemented my broadcast like this? Let's say I have process zero, send data to process one. Well, at this stage, two, process, two processes have the data. So I could then have process zero send data to process two, and then process one send data to process four. And at that stage, I have four processes which have the data. So in the next turn, I could have zero, have zero send data to process three, two to process six, one to process five, and four to process seven. So, so you see where this is going. So this is a much more efficient algorithm, which doesn't scale linearly as with the number of processors. It scales logarithmically with the number of processors. So it is really much faster. And, and this is the algorithm that you, that you should use. But writing your own code to implement something like this would be quite tedious and annoying. So this is why you use a, a broadcast method, because when you call MPI broadcast, you can be sure that underneath this, some quite efficient method is used to actually propagate your data. So using a collective communication like this, your code becomes cleaner, easier to understand. You are accomplishing in one line what required multiple lines previously, and also more efficient. 
because some very efficient algorithm is going to be used to communicate your data. So, so, so these are two excellent reasons to use collective communications in your program as much as possible. So uh, let's uh, try to use this to improve our integral uh, integration code a little bit. So in my integration code, uh, I had values A and B and integer N. So A and B were the limits of integration and N was the number of trapezoids. But let's say I want to make my code somewhat more flexible and I want to be able to read input at runtime. Well, uh, in a parallel program, reading input uh, has, is a bit complicated. You have to be careful because remember that when you're launching your program, you have multiple copies, multiple, multiple processes. So if you have all of them trying to read input, that, that will not work because then multiple processes will be listening to input and you will not know which process is actually reading input from your command line. It's, it's uh, very messy. So what we want instead, we want just one process to be reading the input because then there's no ambiguity, only one process is reading the data. And we want that one process to then propagate the data to all the other processes. So uh, simple enough, I uh, have an if statement which uh, is triggered if rank is zero and then process zero prints out the prompt and then using standard Python input uh, methods, it reads in, it prompts the user to provide A, B, and N, and the user provides it. And then we use the broadcast method. So we call com.bcast A, com.bcast B, com.bcast N. So what happens here is, here I don't specify the root process because uh, I use the default value, and the default value is process zero. So, process, so what happens here is that uh, this value is significant just on process zero. And, uh, but at the end of these calls, every single process has A, B, and N, which is returned by the BCAST method. So here I have read in the values just on process zero and called broadcast so that at the end, every single process has the value. So I have broadcasted, I have propagated my data to the other processors, processes. Okay, now remember that in our integration, we also had uh, a step where we summed up all the partial integrals from all the different processes to get the final answer. Well, this is a reduction operation. And it turns out that as expected, there is a collective operation for reduction. So in our previous code, we used explicit loops. So we had a loop where process zero would do a receive from every other process, and then every other process would do a send. Well, it turns out that we can uh, take care of that circumstance by just using one line. So what are the arguments to reduce? Well, there's the send object. So this is the partial value which you want to combine. So every process uh, that, that calls reduce has to provide that value. So this is the partial sum. We can also specify the operation we want. The default is sum, so the default will just add up the values. But other possibilities are you could look for a maximum or a, or a minimum. And then you can also optionally provide the root value. So this is the process which is uh, supposed to contain the final answer. So, uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is the process which will contain the, the final sum, the result of the operation. Uh, so, and then when you call this function, it will return the result of the operation. But the return actually is valid only on the root process. So the other processes will not have th that number. So that number will not be defined. So you should only use this number on process zero. There is actually a variant of a reduce operation called all reduce. So if you want the result of the summation to be available on all the processes, you call all reduce, but otherwise you just you're careful to only use the result on, on the root process. So uh, let's now look at uh, our integral trapezoid method code again using these ideas. So uh, here I have the preliminaries. I call my get data function. So notice that in my get data as the argument I provide rank, the number of processes and the communicator. 
So I have to pass the communicator because I will be using communicator methods inside that function. So I call this, and at the end of this, every single process has values of A, B, and N, which have been read in from input. So uh, then these next uh, few lines are unchanged. Each process computes its uh, partial integral value. And then look at this. To sum up all these values, only one line is necessary. I call com.reduce. I provide integral as the argument. And this returns total, which is the total answer, the, the all, all the partial uh, integrals added together. And then if I am process zero, I print out the result. So this actually is essential. If I try to print out the total result on any other process except process zero, it will be undefined. Because keep in mind that the way reduce works is it collects the data, but it actually brings it all together only on the root process, in this case, process zero. So the main conclusion here is we have vastly simplified our code. We don't have annoying loops over MPI receive or MPI send. We can do these collective communications in one line. OK, so uh, we are nearing the end of this seminar. So I want to emphasize that we have really barely scratched the surface of uh, MPI. I have shown you the basic MPI calls, MPI send and MPI receive, which allow you to write a basic but functional MPI program. And I have shown you the first extension to these, uh, collective communications, which allow you to do certain very common communications in a very efficient way, just using uh, you know a single line. So let me just give you a quick overview of what are the other features of MPI that you might want to explore. So first, non-blocking communications. So communications are the Achilles heel, if you will, of MPI. Communications are generally much slower than, than, than computations. It takes time to send data from one computer over the, to another over a network. So because it takes such a long time, it is often quite useful to be able to overlap communications and computations. And, and non-blocking communications allow you to do exactly this. With a non-blocking communication, you can start a non-blocking send and start sending the data and then work with some other data while the data that you want communicated is sort of in transit. And then where you get to the point where, you know, you need to finish this uh, communication, you can have a wait call where you wait until the communication has actually completed. So in this way, it is possible to overlap communication and computation, which takes away some of the pain of communications being so slow. Uh, also, you can make your own communicators. So, so far we have uh, only had one communicator which had all the processes. But you can create new communicators which involve subsets of processes. The reason this is good is uh, you can then have collective communications only over subsets of processes. So the collective communications we have seen so far, they have to be called in all the processes of a communicator. So if you have a communicator, the default one, which holds all the processes, then your collective communication has to be called on every single process. And that's fine for some things, but for other things you want more flexibility. So you can make your own communicators. And you can also make your own topologies. In particular, if, you are, if your processes are arranged, if you want to think of your processes as being arranged on a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional grid, which is often quite useful if you are computing an object which is intrinsic, intrinsically two-dimensional like a matrix. So there are special methods in MPI to create communicators well suited to, to that kind of topology. Then we have user-defined data types. So if you want to send some complicated data, you know, mixing integers and floats and so on, you can make your own data types and send them. We have parallel input and output operations. So I haven't talked here about writing to files. So as you can imagine, writing to files in MPI can be a bit uh, inconvenient because if you have multiple processes trying to write to the same file, it's 
quite like, likely that the, the writes will get mixed up and you will not get the data in the order that you want. So one possible way around it is you can have process zero do all the reading and writing to files. So just like uh, I had in my example, I had process zero read the data from input, we could have just process zero reading and writing all the data and then doing communication to the other processes. But the problem there is that you lo lose parallelism because if only one of your processes is doing all the communicate, all the writing and, and reading, then that might become a bottleneck. So there are various techniques in MPI to actually write in parallel and read data in parallel, which are quite useful. Uh, one could spend a long time talking about parallel algorith algorithms in general. So it turns out that if you are trying to solve a, pro prog a problem in a parallel y way, you might need a different algorithm than you use to solve this problem in a serial way. So this is a very active area, area of research. And finally, we could talk about parallel libraries. So uh, if you have standard problems like, let's say, Fourier transform or matrix multiplication or linear algebra, then standard libraries exist which have MPI enabled for, for that kind of a problem. Now, the difficulty, the main difficulty there is that uh, your, in order to use those libraries, your data has to be distributed among multiple processes. So for example, let's say you want to multiply two matrices together using MPI. Well, first you have to distribute your data so that each process has only a, a portion of the matrix, a piece of the matrix. And then you would call a parallel library, which would, uh, do the matrix computation in parallel, and then the final result would also be distributed. So each process would also have a portion of the final answer, and then you would have to bring them together. So uh, I have uh, barely scratched the surface of MPI here, but I hope it uh, gives you some idea of what MPI is like. And I, I encourage you to try to learn uh, more MPI. Again, Python is a very good vehicle for it because it, ha it is much simpler than the, uh, uh, you know, trying to learn MPI with uh, C or Fortran or other complicated codes. Thank you. That's the end of the seminar.